so madam uh, we are live now shall we start yes please yeah. yes is my screen visible yes so good evening doctors uh, it's ramon on behalf of shield healthcare uh, welcoming you all uh, in today's session uh, another session with uh, uh, dr ritu yes santmani madam and uh, dr uh, irena gosiva madam and the topic is ectopic pregnancy so before moving into the session uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, both of the madam as you all know uh, dr ritu is santwani madam who is a veteran uh, ivf specialist more than 20 years of uh, experience in the obstetrics and gynecology service and specialized in cosmetic gynecology and that is to be and madam is uh, having as uh, excellent social and interpersonal and communication skills uh, to interact with the patients and uh, the other staffs associated with the healthcare as well apart from that madam has many association and many activities in terms of social activities and in terms of other uh, uh, professional activities as well madam is a focus certified uh, uh, gestosy certified in hypertensive disorder in pregnancy and she is the honorary fellow of improvement of women's health in uh, indian academy of obstetrics and gynecology and in terms of social activities madam uh, already done many uh, free health checkup camps for under privileged patients across maharashtra who uh, could participate in several uh, culture and um, social activities to uplift the backward classes especially and she is the renowned speaker on infertility and uh, contraception treatment and other various topics as well uh, so with this uh, short introduction uh, and uh, now it's my honor and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, dr arena gosheva madam who is the md specialist in uh, obstetrics and gynecology and presently attached to one hospital private uh, it's a private hospital in terovur republic of north macedonia and she has many awards to her credit uh, in terms of these awards uh, she is the public um, scholarship for graduates education as a sri lankan methodius university gopje uh, of uh, north macedonia and uh, in the year uh, 2005 to 2011 and in terms of academic and uh, research activities uh, she is student research exchange in austria win and the theme of the program was uh, research in allergy under the professor rudolf uh, valenter in department of uh, pathophysiology as uh, she is approved by international federation of medical student association uh, 2018 and in terms of leadership program uh, madam is the vice president of the standing committee on public held as part of Macedonian Medical Students Association a member of International Federation of Medical Students Association and its activities include a vaccination program and other sexual education in terms of professional membership madam is the member of association of the gynecologists and obstetrician of Macedonia 2014 registrant at the Fetal Medicine Foundation FMFID it's given here and she is the member of European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology and a member of Macedonian Medical Association and a member of macedonian association for the residents and uh, young doctors tumne follicle so, dekh liye so in the short introduction i request uh, ritu madam to take over the session for further followings thank you so much yeah thank you dr suman and thank you shil connect a very very warm welcome to my dear friend dr irina uh, here uh, thank you dear irina for taking out your time i know your schedule is very very busy but uh, due to uh, in spite of her busy schedule she has taken out time to enrich all of us with her immense knowledge so friends i want to welcome you all on this uh, global knowledge sharing platform i am able to see some of my friends have also joined across the globe yes my very dear friend dr neelam gupta president ima from delhi has joined dr kariman uh, from the president of lebanon society is also here so a very very warm welcome Uh, Dr. Irina, as what I have heard, that Macedonia is a city of peacocks. Is it correct? Uh, so we are uh, located here in the, the eastern part of uh, southeastern part of Europe. Um, so um, I'm Obijin. We know each other from via other contacts. Well, I work in a private setting uh, in a busy hospital. We run a delivery unit, so we have a lot of night shifts <laughs> and a lot of work. <laughs> okay. So it is my great pleasure that I'm part of this, uh, your talk and uh, all of these webinars that you organize. They're very interesting. Those that I have attended. To and um, it, it is my great pleasure here today to share. some of my knowledge and some of my uh, 
uh, actually cases and very interesting cases that I have had from our clinical part. So I can actually start share screening. Yes, yes please. Uh, yes. yes. So do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, Dr. Irina, yeah. Excellent. So today we're giving a talk on ectopic pregnancy, uh, which we all know the definition for. It's a developing blastocyst that is implanted on a site other than the normal uterine cavity. So we all know that 96% is in the tube, but what is a very challenging for diagnosis are the cervical pregnancy, ovarian pregnancy, abdominal pregnancy, and the intramural pregnancy, which we have a case for, and there are only around 50 cases in the literature published so far. So uh, regarding the incident, there is a very interesting fact that actually back in the time, the rate was much higher than nowadays. Uh, regarding the risk factors, we should always divide them, uh, those with high risk, moderate, and low risk. Those with high risk are actually those that actually women that already have had previous ectopic pregnancy or some tubal surgery, or they have an intrauterine device, whether it was a past use or a current use. Those with moderate risk are those actually mostly with the sexually transmitted infections. And those with low risk are actually those with infertility. So regarding the tubal ectopic pregnancy, we actually don't know if uh, it is around the conditions that delay or prevent the passage of the fertilized oocyte in the, the uterine cavity or the facts and factors inherent in the embryo that result in premature implantation. But what we do know in the pathogenesis is that 90% occur in in patients that have chronic salpingitis, 10% around uh, with ischemic nodosa salpingitis. And um, <clears throat> regarding the embryonic factors, it's actually that this is not an important etiology for an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, what is also we do already know is that the clinical presentation can range from completely asymptomatic to collapse. Recently, I have had on a night shift a very severe case. Uh, she had that only a diaphragmatic sign, uh, irritation with the shoulder tip pain, and she was with hemoperitoneum. It was a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. But uh, what we should remember from this presentation is that the most common symptoms goes with the three A's acronym, the amenorrhea, the abnormal vaginal bleeding, and the abdominal pain. Uh, so I have already given you all uh, like a range of the clinical presentation that can come, but it's usually usually connected with some sort of pain or discomfort in the abdomen or the pelvis, or it might be in the lower back. Whenever um, the, a, 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 we should consider ectopic pregnancy whenever we have any woman of reproductive age plus vaginal bleeding and or abdominal pain. Therefore, we uh, should always see for all women of reproductive age that are pregnant until we prove otherwise, and it is always a topic until we clearly demonstrate that this is the case of intrauterine pregnancy. Do we have a good audio contact, Vito? Yes, yes, it's okay. in the okay, thank you. Regarding the clinical signs. We do have the typical pelvic tenderness, adnexal tenderness, and abdominal tenderness. But what we should always consider is the hemodynamic stability of a patient. So uh, we, should, we should remember that the third uh, column of this table is that we do not use the serum HCG measurements to determine the location of the pregnancy. So uh, we should also, what we should also consider is that the uh, symptoms actually for ectopic pregnancy tend to have very poor prognostic value to differentiate between an intrauterine pregnancy and ectopic pregnancy as well. So what is the main goal for diagnostic evaluation? It's actually, first of all, to confirm that the patient is pregnant. 
Then the second most important thing is to evaluate whether she is hemodynamic stable, stable or she has some instability. And then to determine whether it is about intrauterine pregnancy or ectopic. Then if we cannot do it this side, we perform additional tests. So this is like a table, what we should do, but I have all of this put into an algorithm. But for me, the most important is the evaluation of hemodynamic stability. Because whenever a rupture is suspected, we transfer the patient into the inactive care facility, depends on which type of hospital we work in, where an immediate resuscitation and surgical treatment can be provided for the patient. What we do need to, most important is to assess the vital signs of the patient and complete a fast ultrasound, laboratory test, a complete blood count uh, and blood type screen and cross match for potential transfusion. Those that are hemodynamic stable are much more easier to evaluate, but not all cases. Uh, so the diagnosis when we make a for ectopic pregnancy, after a single measurement of HCG plus transvaginal ultrasound, when the HCG is above the discriminatory zone and when we do not see an intrauterine pregnancy on the ultrasound. So what happens? If we have a pregnant patient that has a vaginal clinic and lower abdominal bleeding, we first evaluate hemodynamicals, whether she is stable or unstable. We perform surgical uh, access and treatment even without pregnancy tests for those that are hemodynamically unstable. For those that are stable, we perform transvaginal ultrasound and confirm if it is an intrauterine pregnancy. Uh, an ectopic pregnancy straight away, or it might be actually non-diagnostic. What happens if we, if the transvaginal ultrasound is actually non-diagnostic? Then we measure the serum human uh, chorionic gonadotropin. So we see if it is beyond or above the discriminatory zone. If it is beyond the discriminatory zone, which we use in our hospital, for 2,000 milliliter national unit per milliliter, we then repeat, um, repeat the HCG every 48 to 72 hours. What is the most important thing? If the HCG increases for more than 35% from the previous value before the 48 hours, then we might have potential viable intrauterine pregnancy. If the HCG increases but less than 30% every 48 hour, then we might consider for treating for topic pregnancy. And if the HCG has already plateaued and now is decreasing, then it might be actually a failed pregnancy, which can be both an intrauterine failed pregnancy or a topic failing pregnancy. If the HCG is above the discriminatory zone, then we still repeat if she's clinically stable. We always see the clinical presentation of the patient. But if she is stable, then we might repeat the HCG and the transvaginal ultrasound in another 48 hours until it reaches the uppermost, uh, 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 the uppermost uh, value of HCG, which is 3,500 million international units per milliliter. But that is only in the case if she is clinically stable and she doesn't suffer from any clinical signs or symptoms. Then we decide if it's intrauterine pregnancy or ectopic, or if it's still non-diagnostic, then we should consider a very rare ectopic pregnancy sites like intra-abdominal uh, uh, pregnancy or assess or other pathology not an ectopic pregnancy, plus the HCG that goes. So actually those that can be something with the pregnancy related and differential diagnosis are uh, spontaneous abortion, the gestational trophoblastic diseases, and um, an imminent, uh, uh, um, imminent abortion or threatening abortion. And those that are not pregnancy related can be cervical vaginal or any uterine pathology or even urinary tract infection or some endometriosis or other type of infection, glyomiomas and 
inflammatory disease. So uh, the ultrasound is basically the most important uh, imaging modality. We can sometimes use MRI, but we don't use the CT. It doesn't have role in evaluation. Even if the patient uh, is uh, hemodynamically unstable, we perform the fast ultrasound uh, to assess uh, the amount of fluid and uh, the, in the abdomen. And you know, for the point, so therefore we decide to further evaluate with surgical treatment. We do not, uh, we do not spend our time using other different uh, radio diagnostic modalities. So the ultrasound technique, we both we can both use the transvaginal and the transabdominal side, but only the transabdominal to assess the free fluid. The Doppler ultrasound has actually limited value in the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy because the trophoblastic tissue has specific high velocity systolic flow and low impedance diet flow. flow. However, an absence, remember this, an absence of a finding of polar Doppler flow in a complex atmosphere of mass does not exclude an ectopic pregnancy because the color Doppler flow cannot actually differentiate between a tubal pregnancy from a corpus luteum. Therefore, we cannot rely on the Doppler. But regarding the 3D imaging mode, it might be actually very useful in the very rare types of uh, ectopic pregnancy sites like interstitial pregnancy and intramural pregnancy. So we all know what happens when uh, the patient is asymptomatic. We then follow uh, the HCG. And uh, regarding the ultrasound, uh, this is a regular corpus luteum. And um, what is very important is also the early endometrial findings. So whenever we have an intrauterine pregnancy, uh, we need to look for a gestational sac. And whenever we think that there is some sort of uh, gestational sac, we need to confirm it with the intradecidual sign or the double decidual sign. So we don't get confused with the pseudostat or some other changes like endometrial cysts. So the, the intradecidual sign can be seen on the 4.5 gestational weeks. And whenever HCG is above 1,500 units, and the double decibel sign can be variable. It, it is variable whenever it can be seen from four to six gestational weeks, and has the typical two concentric echogenic ring encircling the gestational sac. Whereas the pseudo sac does not have the typical uh, double rings or the interdecidual sign or the double decidual sign, you can see it on this photo. And it is uh, a very changing, the pseudosac can change its appearance on the transvaginal ultrasound. So usually, usually the endometrium looks like on the right side of the, the photo. When you see on the, the other side, we have some typical uh, uh, the double decidual sign, whereas on the other side, we have only decidualized endometrium. These are the non-specific findings that this is a well cyst, which should never be uh, mismatched for gestational sac. Be careful. So, but whenever we have a uh, gestational sac and dual sac cross embryo, whether it has a cardiac or it doesn't have cardiac activity, you don't need to perform uh, serum measurements for HCG to say that it's a topic pregnancy. So, uh, I have, uh, uh, this is very interesting that um, regarding the ovaries, uh, it is, um, you can see it's very difficult to distinguish the corpus luteum, but uh, we can always assess the echogenicity when uh, it's uh, on the adnexal side. So the corpus luteum has typical less echo, is usually typically less echogenic than the ovary, whereas the tubal ring of an ectopic pregnancy is more echogenic than the ovarian parent. It's like an important ultrasound fact. But um, what tips to take for home is that whenever there in a woman without evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy, any type of new adnexal mass 
should be further evaluated until the location and status of the pregnancy have been confirmed. So you can see this in this photo, it's typical. Uh, you would rather see that it's a variant pregnancy on the first photo, but it's not. On the second, they are on a variant pregnancy. The third are an old one photos that I have had from a patient with the very strange variant pregnancy. They're very rare though. Uh, and regarding the peritoneal free, free fluid, whenever we have a pregnant woman with peritoneal free fluid and a pregnancy of unknown location, we should, it's usually associated with ectopic pregnancy. So, um, um, but the presence or absence of, or peritoneal free fluid is not a reliable indicator of uh, whether an ectopic pregnancy has ruptured. So remember this, you follow this clinically. Uh, it's the hemodynamical stability that we follow clinically. We do not assess unless it is a huge amount on uh, uh, of free fluid, we cannot reliably say uh, whether it is ruptured or not regarding the, um, the fluid present on the ultrasound. And we all know the typical signs, the ultrasound signs of hemoperitoneum. And we should never be afraid of the normal finding that can be never really normal in treated during pregnancy. A small amount of free fluid which is um, typically hypoechogenic and it does not have uh, other uh, sound, uh, ultrasound uh, um, characteristics. So uh, with tubal pregnancy, it can rupture, it can go into tubal abortion, or it can spontaneously by itself have no resolution. This is the fast ultrasound. This is very important. All of our ER doctors are in our hospital are trained to do this because this is very important. And this is one of the things that interests us the most. Actually, and this is very interesting that many intrauterine pregnancy can be detected at the HCG levels um, beyond 2,000 mil international units per milliliter. But HCG of 3,500 can predict actually 99% probability of visualization of gestational sex. Therefore, if we have a clinically stable patient and she does not complain on any obvious signs, then we should wait actually up to, we can wait actually up to this uh, discriminatory zone. So, um, we, and we, of course, it is most important to uh, say uh, that to emphasize that a single HCG cannot confirm the diagnosis of ectopic or normal pregnancy. The normal pattern in pregnancy can rise and should rise at least 66% every 48 hours. But that's in around 85% of viable intrauterine pregnancy. There is a lower rate rising in actually 15% of normal intrauterine pregnancies. So therefore we use the 35%. We say if it's doubling for 35% or more, well, of course in 72, uh, in 48 hours, then it might be rising normally. It rising, it is rising abnormally. It is beyond this uh, value of 35% from the previous value. Remember, HCG uh, uh, with 2,000 new international units per milliliter and we an ultrasound that does not show an intrauterine pregnancy can be actually an early multiple gestation, a normal pregnancy. I rarely must say that I rarely use the progesterone to differentiate as an adjunctive diagnosis. I have used only aspiration uh, for one case, but remember that actually it has sensitivity of around 70%, so it's not 100% diagnostic. And of course, the closest that's already history in the mother and obstetrics. 
and the clinical the diagnosis is always clinical and if it's the patient stable then we rely on the hcg and transvaginal ultrasound so i would rather um, explain for rare ectopic pregnancy location because we all know the typical tubal ectopic pregnancies so it has uh, for regarding the interstitial pregnancy it has very typical uh, ultrasound findings. It has a gestational sac with eccentric location proximal to the uterine corona. So if you see here, and it has the typical interstitial line here that we see, and uh, it, so, um, many in the clinical practice have uh, uh, have uh, misdiagnosed uh, this as a normal intrauterine pregnancy, but it's a very dangerous uh, ectopic kind of pregnancy. And what is really important that always see the myometrium that is encircling the gestational sac. If you do not see it completely, then consider an interstitial pregnancy. So this is the photos and you see on the right side, it is actually, you might see it as an interstitial pregnancy, but it's actually a patient of mine that has a kind of, this is called an angular pregnancy. So it's something before, like there is very, it's very difficult to differentiate them. But the thing is that we see a full thick decidualized endometrium. So we do not see the typical interstitial line here. And this was actually a missed abortion pregnancy and she ended up uh, with uh, DNC. And you can see the whole defect here. You can see where it was on the next picture, actually in the complete angle, but in the uterus, it wasn't in the interstitial part of the tube, it was still in the uterus. So other rare types are, I will concentrate also on the intramural pregnancy, which I will present here a case of a 20 year old woman that have uh, had uh, previous pregnancies and um, uh, one abortion and two kids. She actually, uh, uh, I will show you now the photo. They're very interesting. So you will see in mid sagittal view, you don't see a gestational sac, but then you see it not on the proper place and not, you do not see uh, the complete endometrium, nor you see the double discal sign, nor you nor the location. So you can see it like more in the ismical part regarding the location, but you can see that it's not central in the cavity. This is a very important sign. If we use the 3D reconstruction, you will see it that it's actually gestational sac that is dipped into, into the myometrium on this side. So this is very interesting, very rare. Uh, these kind of pregnancies have been so far reported around 50 cases in the literature. So this is uh, the Edmexel finding that it's completely uh, normal finding in this woman. So what did we do afterwards? So we performed a comprehensive search through PubMed. So uh, using the keywords intramural ectopic pregnancy, and we searched for results from 1980 to 2020. And we reviewed only 66 articles with relevant data for, for further analysis. So uh, what uh, we should know is that 55 cases in total for intramural ectopic pregnancy, including the case report that we present were analyzed. Um, so, um, first, uh, I will show you the results show to, from our review that uh, regarding the symptoms, 35% of the cases were completely asymptomatic, 
whereas other had already uh, some sort of uh, uh, signs and symptoms ranging from vaginal bleeding to lower abdominal pain up to shock and complete hemodynamic instability. So I have divided this into table regarding the age of which uh, the intramural pregnancy in the 55 cases published so far in the literature have already occurred is actually that is more prevalent in the age group from 30 to 35. Uh, so uh, we excluded the already told you 10 cases. And what is really important that 81% of all of these uh, women had some previous gynecological procedure performed, whether it is DNC or cesarean section or some sort of operation like myomectomy uh, and exactomy, even salpingectomy for this kind of pregnancy. So regarding the symptoms, as I have already showed, five cases, actually 12% of women were in hemodynamically completely unstable and they presented with hemorrhagic shock. Uh, and 30% of them have vaginal bleeding. So regarding the diagnosis, actually, uh, of these 52 cases uh, uh, were analyzed because for the three of them, we didn't have uh, relevant data regarding the diagnostic modality. So 23% of these were diagnosed intraoperatively, whereas 77% were diagnosed using ultrasound uh, MRI or CT. However, MRI have showed much better than CT, as I have already said, uh, we shouldn't use the CT. Uh, computer tomography for evaluation of ectopic pregnancy, whether what kind of location it is. And uh, we should always rely on the ultrasound. And what's really interesting that um, very few, uh, most of the our colleagues during this whole time uh, zone used actually mostly the color Doppler, but only in three cases used 3D modality, which is actually the single most important factor for diagnosis of this type of rare, uh, rare uh, ectopic type pregnancy, the intramural pregnancy. So most of them used 2D plus color Doppler, but rarely who used the 2D and the 3D mode. So they, most of them describe this as asymmetrically large uterus, like a hyperechogenic mass surrounded by myometrium, but no connection to the endometrium. And as I already said, all of them use the color Doppler, but it's inconclusive actually. So therefore we have suggested the criteria for diagnosis of intramural, intramural pregnancy. So the first is that the gestational sac located above the orificium uterine interni, so just above the uh, ismical border. And we should see this in the sagittal plane, including the cervix, remember. So gestational sac is located medial to the interstitial tube and always visualize the proximal segment of the interstitial tube in the junction with the uterine cavity. So therefore you will exclude an interstitial pregnancy and always evaluate the endometrium and myometrial junction. That's like a take home tip. Uh, therefore you will analyze it for whether it is a partial or complete intramural pregnancy and always perform 3D in a coronal plane. So the color Doppler may help you to distinguish the structure from fibroid, but not the type of ectopic pregnancy. So all of these patients in the literature were analyzed uh, regarding the uh, treatment they were uh, treated, 4% uh, of them expectantly. 11% were, were treated with uh, metatrexat, and uh, you, you can see this uh, serious result. It was like 85% of them were treated operatively, whereas uh, an excision and repair were done in 30 cases, and uh, operative plus metatrexat in six cases, uterine artery embolization in one, and one even patient delivered up to 35 weeks, I think. And, um, all of the operative both treatment and diagnosis have final histopathologic diagnosis of intramural pregnancy. 
And nine of these cases from these 55 were actually misdiagnosed as missed abortion. So they have performed like several times DNC, but they didn't have the specimen. So, um, so therefore, uh, if you properly use the 2D and the 3D ultrasound, you might actually save the woman for from misdiagnosis and uh, misinterventions and a lot of unnecessary interventions. So we have also proposed uh, risk factors for this kind of very rare topic pregnancy. And those with high risk are actually those that have some, as I already said, some previous um, operation uh, performed uh, gynecological disc. Moderate risk are actually those with that in meiosis because it's very connected with this kind of ectopic pregnancy. And those with low risk are actually that those that have, those that are in their first pregnancy. So, uh, so for conclusion, the most important is always uh, obtain uh, the uterus and the gestational sac and coronal plane using the 3D mode. So uh, although intramural pregnancy is rare, we believe it is necessary to establish a precise definition and clarification system in addition to diagnostic and treatment guidelines for the intramural pregnancy in order to effectively treat those that are affected for, from this kind of pregnancy. So, uh, the, the, so far, we know that the treatment is individualized uh, because there are very few cases published in the literature and uh, depends upon the clinical presentation, the exact location of the pregnancy, the viability, the gestational age, and the diagnosis. And, um, and regarding the treatment, because uh, there are many different terminologies, uh, we suggest that most of the operative interventions should be uniformly classified as uterine sparing surgery. So no confusion arises regarding the terminology because you can read it there. It was performed excision, but a wedge excision, many different terminologies. So we are like uh, suggesting that maybe we all as a gynecologist should some should do some uh, classification system regarding the treatment uh, for this uh, patient regarding the surgical treatment. So other rare kind of pregnancy is a uh, variant pregnancy. Um, remember, the ipsilateral tube is intact. The gestational sac is located somewhere in the ovary, around the ovary. And um, it is uh, ovarian tissue is always found in the wall of the gestational sac by histopathological analysis. So another type of area of pregnancy is the abdominal pregnancy. And you can always see the, uh, uh, the embryo fetus next to the uterus where you will see an empty uterus and the whole uterus with its borders. And uh, the treatment depends on the case. Uh, so, uh, and the gestational weeks of the patient. And uh, this is for the whole placenta if it is uh, uh, um, an advanced pregnancy. So these are very difficult cases to solve. So the treatment should be always individualized. Uh, regarding the cesarean scar pregnancy, which is rising as an ectopic type of pregnancy, uh, it can also have clinical manifestation ranging from completely asymptomatic to various vaginal bleeding, plus, plus minus pain, and or uterine rupture or hypoblemic shock. It is, I would say, a complete state of art to treat it surgically. So it depends on, again, I would say the gestational age, the symptoms of the patient, and uh, it has um, it, 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 it is actually easy to diagnose. It's not a difficult diagnosis. If uh, you should just not mix it with a cervical kind of uh, cervical pregnancy, but uh, it is um, we can always use the MRI as an adjunctive diagnosis. So. Uh, as I have already said, the surgical approach is a complete state of art. So we can perform a DNC as a first line therapy without uterine artery embolization, actually can result in perforation and catastrophic hemorrhage. So therefore, wet resection of the ectopic pregnancy via laparotomal laparoscopy or hysteroscopic excision should be performed. 
but it's very, very difficult to solve. It, it takes good uh, operating team and very, very good anesthesiological team because the hemorrhage is very profound. So uh, regarding cervical pregnancy, they are like, I always say for them, they are like uh, tempted bombs. And um, it has, uh, it should always be distinguished with ultrasound from uh, an abortion that is already uh, happening. So remember this, that whenever you see under speculum, but always, always perform it very carefully, it, you will see a bulging cervix. So, and the OE is always closed, whereas an incomplete abortion is a bit dilated. So whatever you do, just avoid the manual examination. It can cause hemorrhage and it can end up disastrously if you do not, not have the proper surgical skills to solve it. So we have the typical hourglass shaped uterus with balanced cervical uh, with balanced cervix. Uh, whenever we have a stable patient, we can always use the MRI as an adjuncting diagnosis. You can see it is here. So it's like typical the hourly shaped uh, uh, uterus. Um, this is the MRI, but this is for a very advanced pregnancy. And the, the, the differential diagnosis for cervical pregnancy can be uh, ectopic brain, uh, can be spontaneous abortion, cervical pain, or other uterine pathology. And um, uh, remember this that bleeding can be incomplete, abortion tends to be self limited. And the differentiation of this is usually made with transvaginal ultrasound. So, this is so thoroughly uh, written about the surgical treatment uh, for the cervical ectopic pregnancy. And uh, we all, all know, and uh, in, in, I would stick to my time frame that Rita gave me, I wouldn't have um, much time to explain all of this, whether whenever to choose MTX or uh, surgical treatment. But MTX, remember that it's always contraindicated in hemodynamic and stable patient. And, um, and uh, we have factors that impact the MTX efficiency treatment are the high HCG concentration, the fetal cardiac activity, large ectopic size, and peritoneal fluid. And um, the outcomes depends on where is the ectopic pregnancy, how was the clinical state, what was the gestational age, and uh, what kind of uh, treatment was choose in the first place. So um, the, regarding the expectant management, it can be only reserved for the asymptomatic patients. It has very strict, actually, a very tight um, indication field for expectant management. This is a whole um, algorithm for it. And um, even remember that uh, regarding the tubal ectopic pregnancy has been reported in women with even with low and declining values. So it can go rupture, so you can never actually predict it. So um, whenever we decide for MTX, we should do, first of all, the lab test, the blood type and screen to determine the need if afterwards uh, the woman needs an anti-D immunoglobulin, rogam or rogulac. And uh, regarding the doses of protocol, whether it should be used a single dose or multi-dose, uh, it's actually uh, where is the, depending on where is the pregnancy, how big is the pregnancy, what's the value of HCG. And um, there's 90 success percent rate of uh, success rate for both single and multiple dose protocols. Remember that. So well, this is uh, very important that uh, the safe interval from intake treatment to conception is actually unclear because the toxicology literature recommends a four to six month washout period before attempting to become again pregnant. And um, 
Uh, yeah, I have a lot of, lot of slides for, they, they are reserved for the surgical treatment, but um, the, what is the most important thing and what we should not, uh, what we should always remember is the anti of prophylaxis for all uh, ERHA negative patients. Uh, and this would be my presentation in full, and I'm waiting for your questions. If uh, uh, we are here, so thank you, thank you so much, Irina, for a very fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, let me see your screen is fast. Stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I have a lot of slides. They have, um, I can send you the whole uh, presentation if somebody wants to review it thoroughly because I don't have time so much to talk about. Each kind of ectopic pregnancy should, it has its own guidelines, how it can be treated. And it's not like um, one uh, surgical approach fits all women depends everything on the case, everything on the type of where it is. As I always say, the cervical pregnancies are like bombs completely and, and the metrial scar uh, pregnancy, topic pregnancy, those surgeons that solve this, I always say they are true artists. It's a complete state of art regarding the surgical approach. Regarding the typical tubal pregnancies, it's, we all know the, the, we even studied during the residency, but for the rare topic pregnancy sites, it's state of art to solve it surgically. So uh, all, 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 all of the time, new types of approaches are presented and it's very interesting to follow them. But uh, I have presented to you the diagnostic approach for very rare topic pregnancy, and I hope you, some of you, took some tips for tips for home. Uh, please, I'm um, welcome for the for questions. If anybody has any question, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, thank you so much. Because the topic pregnancy itself is a very very vast topic and you have covered very nicely all the points in that especially the intramural and interstitial pregnancy very nicely covered yes totally agreed with you yes the cervical ectopic pregnancy is a nightmare for all a of complete people. nightmare yeah, complete yeah. nightmare yeah yeah so program has gone live on the youtube also so till we are receiving the questions because i'm able to see that my friends have joined all across the geography some friends have joined from the saudi some from australia some from bhutan some mm -hmm. i can see from nepal i see so questions I here and experience yes. yes. pregnancy. Till, till more, no, but till i have more. had one patient with uh, heterotopic oh. pregnancy yeah. But it, it actually failed, even the intrauterine part and the ectopic part, but it was in the tube. But it failed by its own, and we didn't treat the patient, nor with MTX, nor with surgical treatment. It was a failing pregnancy, actually. And regarding the twin ectopic pregnancy, it depends on where is the other twin, uh, whether the one is in intrauterine or, or whether the other one is... Uh, on ectopic site or whether the two of them are in ectopic site. So it uh, depends on the case. So if you if you have a twin that is uh, one is in the uterus and the other one is not, then you always tend to save the one that whatever you do a both in tube. Well, then you treat it for like tubal ectopic pregnancy. It depends on the clinical state of the patient. And uh, if she's not stable, then you perform surgical approach. If she's clinically stable, then you can try with MTX. But are the both of them in the same tube or the different tubes? Dr. Deepti, if you can uh, uh, write us in little detail, that will be easy for Dr. Irina to answer your query. Yes, both in the same tube, yeah. You treat it as uh, the, for the typical protocols as for tubal ectopic pregnancy. So the key issue here is uh, you've been thinking 
thoroughly and seriously of the approach uh, uh, of the treatment approach if one of the twin was in the uterus if the two of them are in two if you're just treating if she's clinically stable the gestational sac is small uh, you don't use the the hcg as a discriminatory zone to uh, rely on using the intakes because in twin pregnancies, you have always very high HCG values. But if she's clinically stable, if both of the stacks are very, very small, if there is no big amount in the uh, in the free fluid, then you might actually try with medicamentous uh, treatment. But if she'd not really have a case with twin stack in a tube, the tube was enlarged more than the size of your uterus, but did not rupture. I told you, you can never rely on whether it will rupture or not. You can even try to treat it with even the dropping values of HCG are not predictive of uh, rupture. You can never rely on that. That's why you have the patient in the hospital setting. So you can always observe her whenever she will, she will have or she will not have a rupture. Uh, there's one more question from Dr. Sanjay Jadav. Uh, any experience with ectopic pregnancy? Yes, I have. Uh, actually, it was um, uh, pregnancy uh, after IVF uh, and embryo transfer in a patient with secondary uh, infertility that have had uh, previously a uh, cesarean section like seven years ago. And unfortunately, it was a cervical pregnancy. I think I, I, I even have some 3D photos of that patient. It came out to be cervical pregnancy, which is very rare for IVF and ET. Usually, usually when they're topic, they are tubal pregnancy topic, but this was a cervical one. You cannot, um, in, infertility as its own is a very low risk for a topic pregnancy, but IVF, as a procedure, hires the risk for ectopic pregnancy. And if she already had an ectopic pregnancy before, then the risk like triples for the patient for the next um, pregnancy to be ectopic. But you can never, uh, could you elaborate more about the decidual cysts? Yeah, the decidual cysts are like very simple hypoechogenic cysts they do not have the hyper echogenic rim. That's the major difference between a gestational sac and a decidual cyst. The, the gestational sac has a decidual rim, or if it is bigger, it has a double decidual sign. But the decidual cyst never have a hyper echogenic rim. They're just hypo echogenic formation by its own in the endometrium, they can be arranged anywhere in the endometrium. They do not have to go position central or eccentric. So that's that. Yeah. Uh, Irina, I received one question in the YouTube also. Uh, uh, the question is by doctor. So uh, writing that previous appendicectomy or previous cesarean section uh, is the chances of increased future ectopic pregnancies? I have, I uh, think I have shown this slide. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. we did a complete analysis of this. We actually believe that those that have had any kind of surgical treatment, whether it is cesarean section or myomectomy or even DNC, dilatation and keratage or any kind of uh, intervention actually uh, uh, hires the risk for ectopic pregnancies and even for the very rare kind of ectopic pregnancy, like the case that I have presented with the intramural pregnancy. So they are very actually uh, very uh, risk, high risk factors for a patient to have uh, uh, an ectopic pregnancy of a rare site. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Irina. Uh, Dr. Irina, we have to wait for a few minutes for for the for a few more questions. So, okay. Yeah, as the my program name is the icons and conversation with Dr. Ritu. 
so now on the lighter note let's play a rapid fire round so here i will ask you some questions you have to answer in one word without thinking much okay okay so okay. let's start so let's start so let us know which is your favorite fruit a uh, banana okay okay which is your favorite color blue okay which is your favorite <laughs> ice cream ice cream yeah which which is your favorite ice cream a uh, strawberry okay favorite chocolate <laughs> favorite chocolate um i usually uh, tend to be most of the time on diet so okay <laughs> okay so the, these are the some non academic questions i'm asking you so uh, which which is your favorite uh, which is your favorite hobby copy hobby 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 oh i yeah. play the piano wow that's great that's yeah. great yeah and uh, who is your inspiration oh uh i guess my mom <laughs> she's great. not a doctor but uh, she's an inspiration for me for my whole life and uh, regarding the gynecology uh there are several people i would say but most of them uh, regarding from which part but uh, there are some like five people that i think left a huge impact in the whole gynecological and obstetrical society worldwide and i do believe that in our time that are people that left serious advancements uh, in this area so that that <laughs> it, it would be selfish to name them but <laughs> i think we all know some like five ten people that did some major things in the gynecology okay. and obstetrical units so is it your is this yeah not just the sorry is it decided or is this your dream from the childhood to become a doctor and that to a gynecologist and actually uh, i have i wanted to be a musician so i oh, wanted to okay. play piano and but because i'm a former ib student i have finished my high school studies in ibo So you know that like an international program. I then said like, oh, I was very good in math, chemistry, and and uh, biology, and then I said I actually think that I'm a good candidate for medicine. And regarding the gynecology, I started to love it when I was on my medical studies. I actually love it the delivery unit. Uh, I still work in the delivery unit right now. <laughs> That's good. Any of your favorite childhood memory that you want to share with all of us? Oh, uh, which you can bring a bit. That would be my holidays with my family. So I have a lot of them, but the holidays are like my best childhood memories. I think even my children now because I have two oh, kids. Thank you. Thank I think you. that their favorite time is the holiday too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. We thank have received so. questions. Um uh, yeah. Yeah. One is from yeah, two three questions here. Really. One is from Dr. Geetanjali. Uh Dr. Geetanjali is writing if it is ectopic pregnancy and needed self injectomy. which is better total or partial injectable uh depends on the side whether it is to go on pulley or fimbrio part uh and depends on the uh, extent of damage of the tube so you can always uh you decide that um 
intraoperatively, you can never rely on the criteria given before, whether to perform salpingectomy or uh, salpingotomy. Uh, because uh, the last uh, ectopic that we had, she was so emergent that and such a severe blood loss she had that we didn't even have time to perform salpingotomy. We actually quickly tried to uh, to perform salpingectomy and just like release from the abdomen from that whole blood and just like wash that out afterward, wash it, wash it, wash it. So you can actually see something there. So it depends on the uh, one depend. Uh, I see a very interesting question for the local entities. Um, my experience, I don't have actually <clears throat> great experience with that. Uh, but uh, regarding the literature review, there are many great uh, obstetricians and gynecologists that do favor the local antics, especially for the rare ectopic pregnancy sites. So I would rather say that it is again uh, where it is, if it is interstitial, what the the gestational lineage, how big is the gestational sac? Does it have any other symptoms? Does it have any other imminent rupture? And what the future uh, perspective of the reproduction of the patient? So what my, I cannot state from my point of view regarding the local intake because I, have, I, I don't use it as a treatment option, but many other amazing surgeons worldwide use it. So maybe you should address this question to another one that have used this as a therapy. But it does have amazing <laughs> guidelines with the local antics, especially for the rare uh, types of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Kiran, uh, Dr. Irina has already shown the slides for this methotrexate presentation. I think you have joined late. So already she has covered everything. So yeah. So I think we have taken all the questions. So thank you Irina once again for giving your precious time to us. And thank you to all of the delegates who have joined all across the globe. So with this, we will wind up for the, today's session. So thank you once again to Shield, uh, Shield Pharma also who are providing the platform. And friends, do join us again on the next Thursday, same timing, 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time. We are uh, on the next Thursday, we are having the Dr. Salva Bakli with us. A very renowned name like Dr. Irina in the field of the cosmetic gynecology. So see you all on the next Thursday. Yeah, thank you once again, uh, dear Dr. Irina. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your invitation. It was very glad for me. And I'm honored to be part of your talk. Hi to all. Yeah. Hope to meet you sometime soon in person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully. <Yeah. laughs> Depending yeah. on the situation with the pandemics. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shil Pharma. Thank you, Chitra Ju, for providing the platform. With this, we will okay. find up for the presentation. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to provide all these things and uh, for this nice uh, presentation with Dr. Mirena and obviously for uh, organizing and uh, moderating all these things uh, to Ritu ma'am especially. I would like to sincere, convey my sincere gratitude to you and I further would like to thank you all the doctors for joining this nice academic event and for being with us in this evening. It's a great pleasure. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, dear. Bye-bye. Thank you.